Hi everybody, I'd like to just start with asking how many of you have experience making games? Hands up. This is actually going to help me going forward. So yeah, okay, a couple of people, that's awesome. Well, this is actually going to help us because you and I are going to be imagining that we're making a game. Okay, so the game is like this. It's called Stick and we're going to be making Stick 2. So stick, um, stick 1 was a pretty simple game. You played a stick, you walked past um, various things, and the stick had an amazing ability to jump. The stick could jump over things, and that's it. That was stick 1, so that's what we're going for. It worked before, and it is going to work again, because the game performed really well, right? Awesome. Now, of course, stick 2 is stick 2. It can't just be like a simple game like that, right? So we're going to add red hearts to the game, right? And we all know what red hearts do. Right? Awesome. We're going to put them in the left upper corner and forget about them for now. But at this point, we've got a working prototype. We're going to try and do something with the game. We're going to give it to our game designers and to our team. And what usually happens when we test what's on the slides. The team says, yeah, like, the game is a bit too easy. You know, I can beat all the levels. It's pretty simple. And you as a game designer, you just go, OK, we need to add more stuff. There needs to be more stuff. So more enemies, platforms that you can jump off of. Of course, stick to needs hearts and stuff like this. Because if we didn't have that, well, the game would be boring. However, like as, as progression starts happening, as more things need to be happening for the players to really have fun. So what are we going to do? We're going to add a new mechanic. It's going to be called, well, Everybody likes roguelikes, right? So we're going to add a roguelike mechanic to the game. You come to a little box, it gives you powers, you pick it up, you pick one of the powers, and you go on. So you're doing this, you're picking up boxes, it's an amazing game, you jump over enemies, there's more and more powers, of course there's levels, of course there's levels, and there's more and more levels. And all of the game is now at this point, like players are really going to love it, right? Awesome. So once... Um, well, once they love it, we also need to make some money from it because we need to get our salaries from somewhere. So we're going to put video watches um, onto the hearts. And since we all know what the red hearts do, right, video watches are going to work. Excellent. There's, of course, not enough money from that. So we're going to also have a subscription model where the players, because the main mechanic is, of course, roguelikes, and everybody likes roguelikes, we're just going to uh, lock the other two powers. They'll be able to see it, of course, um, but they're only going to be able to pick one. Well, it's not really picking. They're just going to be assigned one, essentially. Okay, at that point, the players love the game. We have some money coming in for it. And the only thing left is, well, we need skins, right? We need skins for the stick because players are gullible. Like, let's be honest. Anything we put in the game, if it's, there's a buy button on it, they're just going to buy it. So there's going to be sticks, and they're going to be different colors. And of course, we're going to put a hat on it. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, is stick to ship it. It's going to be an awesome game. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Rok. Um, I make games in Output 7. Now some of you hopefully catched a couple of things that were slightly problematic with that story. And the interesting thing that if you listen to the story as is, yeah, they might seem absurd, but once you get into game design, once chaos starts happening, once a game starts to be made, all of these little things, all of these little decisions, all of these little biases start to creep in as we make our games. Right. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to actually inspect this little story we just had because there were five specific things that happened during the process of designing this game that made it so that, well, let's be honest, at the end it's a bit of a shit pile to be completely honest. So we're going to look at these biases and we're going to try to be mindful of when they happen when making games so that when you go out there and make games, you'll be able to be mindful of these things so they don't derail your game. Now, before we go forward, we of course need to agree on what a bias is, and I'm just gonna read this because, God lords, I can't remember this. The action of supporting or opposing a particular person or thing in an unfair way because of allowing personal opinions to influence your judgment. That was bias means, and for all of you that don't read the Cambridge Dictionary, um, it, basically I wrote this. It's, I think something is true, it influences what I'm doing, and I don't think about it much. 
That is basically how a bias creeps into a game or anything else that you're doing and can sort of derail it or even make it pretty bad, actually. So now that we all agree on what this is, let's start with the biases. Did, did anybody maybe catch some of them? Like, I was pretty, pretty obvious with some of them. Any ideas? What was, what was this? Hats, yes. So the hats ones, I specifically said players are gullible, right? They're just gonna fucking buy anything you put into a game. So essentially, you know, just do that. Well, not exactly true. There was one that I said at the very beginning um, that usually people miss, and it's, it worked before, and it'll work again. So that was actually the first one because we're making a sequel, right? The second one is everybody knows what red hearts mean, obviously. Um, the game is too simple. We all like roguelikes and players are gullible, which is the last one that you pointed out, so good job. You get an extra thousand points for whatever this competition is. I have no idea. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go through all of these so that we can understand them in a little bit better. So it worked before and it's gonna work again. Essentially, this one is, you know, we've gone into a game and we just assume that whatever we did previously, it's gonna work again because reasons. Maybe the first game we made was really good, but the problem is that, you know, these heuristics that we use, that means basically just a way to do something because it's worked before, it may not work again. For example, can you imagine selling a stack of encyclopedias to teenagers today, for example? That is essentially impossible. However, if you did that like 30 years ago or like 40 years ago, there would be teenagers that would go, oh my God, I want to have all of the world's knowledge at my fingertips. Mom, please buy me this. Um, so hopefully, you know, at this day and age, if you come up to a kid with 20 encyclopedias, they just tell you to go away, I have a phone in my pocket, I don't need them, right? So things might have changed from how they used to work and how they work today. And the second thing is, you might have not understood why the thing worked in the first place. Imagine a match three game with butterflies. And every time you match three butterflies, they fly away in a really cool way, right? So you've got this match three game and you decide we're gonna make match three too. So this, the sequel of match three. I don't know why it's called match three and three two, but it works. Anyway, you do that one and it's again match three, but there's dinosaurs and they're amazing and there's big dinosaurs on the side and there's progression systems and the game is essentially better, but it performs really badly. And what you missed is that actually why our game worked in the first place is because people liked butterflies and you remove that out of the game. So you've got to be careful when you know, thinking of new things that are going to revol rev revolutionize your game. Right, so this usually happens when like sequels are happening or when you're transferring various features from maybe other games that you've made and just thinking, ah, it's worked before, it'll work again. It may not. Right, next one. Everybody knows what red hearts mean, right? Who knows what red hearts are? Life, there you go. HP. Yes, it can be love. In fact, there's a game called Undertale that actually plays on this exact thing where they like show you the hearts and they actually say, this is love. Um, which is, yeah, it could actually be love. And where do we learn these things? Well, we learn them because we're gamers and we know them. And assuming that the player also knows this does not work. So where, uh, where I work, we, a lot of our games Kids also play them, so we have to constantly be mindful of this because if you show hearts to a kid, they actually probably will just go, ah, they love each other, that's so good. And look, they hit me and I lose a heart because they took it and they're gonna love the other people with that heart that they took from me, right? So stuff like that can start happening. Um, it can also just mean culture. Right? Maybe a red heart here means health or love, and maybe somewhere else it means I will pull out your heart and kill you, um, which can be a, a similar thing, but different, you know? Very similar to love, I suppose. But yes, um, increasing our boarding time. So what essentially this does is, if you increase how much stuff a player needs to know before they can actually play your game, that just means it takes so much longer for them to understand it. Um, and the longer this time is, so from what the player knows, to where the player needs to be, the longer this is, well, the less players you're actually gonna have because you're gonna lose them along the way and I should have taken the other microphone. All right, awesome. So the next one is um, why this is actually problematic. So if you have players that don't understand what's going on, for example, a kid that gets hit and the heart is taken away, but then they die and they're like, why, why is this happening? I'm spreading love all over the world and I die in the end, right? 
The main problem, obviously, this being like we've said already, using like gamer UI or doing bad tutorials or stuff like this. We'll talk a bit more about how to fix these things in the next step um, of these uh, little biases. Right, the next one is the game is too simple. So what happens often is that we assume player skill. So we just go, oh my god, the players are gonna figure out everything, we need to put everything into the game. There's, there's not enough enemies, there's not enough uh, functions, there's not enough, just, we need more. Why does this happen? Does anybody know? Yes, I see people thinking, or just awkwardly shaking their heads, please don't look at me. You, sir, in the, with the long hair, look very similar to my hair. Please answer, why, um, why do you think um, this is the problem? Oh, that was uncannily uh, awesome right now. So yeah, uh, hi, Jakob. I just happened to know you, so I did mean the guy in front. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> You took this, it's, it's fine. You can, uh, we, we'll both give an answer. Yes. Um, it's uh, missing, completely missing why players want to play the game. Okay, yeah, that, that was actually really cool. Um, it could be completely missing why the players um, even play the game and like players are just not going to play it, right? Essentially, you're going to lose all of those players. But why does it also happen that we, as the designers, we start assuming players' skill and like we just want to make the game more? Right, we want to put more stuff into it. What do you think? You can say your name first. Okay, my name is Max. Hello, Max. So I can guess that in the first game, Stick One, mm -hmm. we have uh, one target audience, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, they like the simplicity of this game. Mm -hmm. And in the second one, the game has cha will change. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gamers of the previous one wouldn't be able to play this. It would be hard for them. Mm -hmm. okay. Something like that. <laughs> okay, and yes, exactly. That's exactly what happens. And it happens because you are the best player of the game when you're making it, essentially. Right? Like the team that's making the game um, that are also the people that are assuming, you know, how hard the game needs to be are like working on it literally 8 to 12 hours a day. So the artists know exactly which, mo which enemy does what because they made the models. The programmers know exactly which thing to press because it will trigger that thing with that function and they can fucking calculate the trajectories of stuff to destroy the game. And the game designers wrote the, literally wrote the thing. So what happens is as your team gets more experienced at the game, it becomes really easy for you. And what you start looking for is that excitement. And you're like, oh my god, we need something cool in the game. And the artists go, yes. We're gonna put more stuff into it. It's gonna look amazing. And the programmers say, we need more difficulty, it's too easy. And the game designers say, I don't know what I'm doing. Because that's usually what we say. Um, but essentially what happens is you start balancing the game for your team's expectations, um, not the actual target audiences, like you said. And that can completely derail a game. I'm taking way too much time, but okay. We all like roguelikes. Okay, so this one usually splits the room. We all like roguelikes, right? There we go, see, there was a no's, there was yeses, excellent. So usually, yeah, what happens is either people go, of course, yes, yes, we all, everybody likes roguelikes. And on the other side of the room, there's usually a couple people that say, what the fuck is a roguelike, I have no idea. Um, and that's usually what happens, right? And uh, this is exactly why that is a problem. Because we can have um, some assumptions about the stuff that we like. Everybody likes this. And this can trickle down to like simple things, like for example, unicorns. Everybody likes unicorns, right? There's just those people that don't like unicorns, so we're gonna put unicorns in the game because they're nice and they're cute. Or rainbows, or pink stuff, or swords and daggers and guns. Whatever you like, you might wanna put it into the game just cause, and that creates tunnel vision. Like it just limits your creativity and everything else because essentially, well, you know, you like that. And other people might not, right? So the biggest problem that comes out of this is there might be a mismatch of, game, mismatch of a game on a feature. So imagine if you have a football manager. You have a spreadsheet, it's a Google spreadsheet, and you've got all of the players and you know their stats, and you're like, oh my god, yes, this is amazing, I love this. And the player really enjoys this. And then you, as a game designer, really likes roguelikes, decides to just go, ah, here are three random players you need to pick from to go into your team. And like the player really, f like they, they worked so hard to create the perfect spreadsheet of players and then you throw a random player into their game, right? Which can completely ruin and destroy what the game is supposed to be doing. So, 
adding a feature that doesn't need to be there, or this can actually just be adding more art assets for artists, for example, make it flashier, make it bigger, right? And the last one, players are gullible. So this one is money, and money is important because we need to pay rent. Um, and oftentimes with this bias, we just assume that players don't feel cheated, that they don't care, that they're just gonna, you know, they'll take it, they'll love it, they'll throw money at us, they love us anyway. Now, the sad thing about this is that that's basically just not re respecting the player, but the other side of that truth is that it works. So you look at, you know, you look at the revenue for the game, you do these kinds of things, and the revenue just goes pop, 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 and you're like, oh yes, this was good, excellent. The problem is that long term, this is usually um, where problems start to come in. You've lost the respect of your players, the players have lost the respect of you, which means that in a while, if you're using all of these like really, really bad in-app purchases for random stuff, like for example, skins of a stick, everybody knows that there's, well, I just said that that's a bias if you say everybody, but a lot of people know that that's just a reskin that took you no time at all and you're charging money for it, for example. Or if you're putting ads on everything just because um, long-term players are gonna churn away and maybe when your next game hits, they will already be thinking, they're just gonna shower me with ads. I'm not even downloading. All right, that was a lot. I know it's a lot. So we're gonna take a moment Okay, awesome. So, what are we gonna do in the second uh, round? Um, it's, it's actually gonna be very similar, but we're just gonna take a different perspective on the biases that we just talk, talked about. So, these were, it worked before, it'll work again, everybody knows what red hearts mean, the game is too simple, uh, we all like roguelikes, and players are gullible. Right, now, we're gonna look at when and how to notice these particular ones. Now, I'd like to point out that this is in no way an exhaustive list. I, in fact, had a larger list, but because I don't want to kill people as they're listening to me for like a long time, um, I shortened it down, and I'm pretty sure that you guys, when you've been making on games, you probably noticed stuff like this happen. Maybe from your teammates, maybe from yourself. Um, so do try to think about these things and how you would notice them in your own production cycles, because that's where all of this even becomes useful, right? All right, so we're gonna be doing this by basically just asking ourselves when it happens, so that during production, you can be extra mindful. And we're gonna be asking ourselves how to notice this, how to notice it. So this is usually, I've already gone way too deep, and I'm probably affected by a bias, and I'm gonna testify out. okay? Awesome. And we're going through all five again, because I try to make it as simple as possible, because repetition is good. Okay, it worked before and it'll work again. So when does this usually happen? I would say this is like a pre-production thing, and I've seen it most times in outfit, like this is pre-production usually. So we did this thing on a game, on a new game that we're making. Um, we were basically thinking about the game and what the core mechanics are, and then there was like a progression system, where it's like a sticker album things, right? And we were like, yes, we will put sticker albums into the game, it's going to work, it worked before, and it'll work again, because it worked in all our other games. We go into the production cycle, we start making all of the games, and they were like, you know, we make it to the point where we need to start making this progression system, and we look at it, and we just go, uh-oh. This is not gonna work, is it? Um, because it just didn't fit the game at all at that point anymore. And if we didn't just go, ah, forget about it, it's gonna work, thank you. Did I speak for like two minutes where I was holding that up? Okay, I've, I'm already losing time, I'm sorry. Anyways, what happened there is if we would've just taken like another meeting to think about this, we would've avoided an entire production it's about two weeks of production by just thinking about this a bit earlier, right? So that that progression system wouldn't have worked. And um, how to notice this? Um, market research is a pretty, pretty uh, good thing to do here. It's basically just making sure that the game that you're releasing, the game that you're making isn't either old or that the actual fit of the game is going to work. Um, if you're looking at your data, please don't look at data from 2012. It is 2023. It needs to be at least a few years, you know, it needs to be updated um, because the world has changed. Um, so, you know, this is the don't sell encyclopedias to people if they don't want to buy them, essentially. Right. Now, what am I doing with the clicker? That's being a bit slow. So everybody knows what red hearts means. So this usually starts happening, quite self-explanatory, I guess, when you're doing UX design, um, and especially when designing tutorials. So 
for anybody that's designed a tutorial, you know, it's exceptionally hard. But what also is pretty important when making a tutorial is not assuming that the player knows what something does. For example, if a Red Hearts thing goes into your game, you need to tutorialize it, especially if your audience is very broad. Now, what this might cause is people to get really bored during the tutorial. So there's a couple of tricks that you can do. It can be just, for example, what we did with one of our games. Um, we were introducing new enemies, essentially. And if a player is really good at the game, they will kill it immediately, that's it. They will understand that they'll go on, there will be no tutorial whatsoever. If the, game, if the player is really shit at the game, they will uh, not know how to destroy it, kill it, or even interact with it, which is the point, which is like five seconds into the encounter, where we're gonna go, oh, you're not very good at this, here's a tutorial hand, look, you need to, do, you need to press here to kill the thing. Um, and that's a trick that you can use for like, skilled players to just blast through the tutorial, not even notice that it's there. But, skilled, uh, but low skill players can still you know, just pass through the game, right? All right, so um, how to notice it? I think user tests are your best friend here. Um, like we, we do quite a few user tests here, um, especially non-gamer tests, so with people that don't know how to play games. Kids, are, um, if you play games, um, um, if you make any games that kids are also going to play, they're an awesome start because they're just going to show you the things, like the things that you think you know, you, you don't know them, and kids are going to be very upfront about that. And just gonna, they're just going to drop the phone and go, I don't like this, um, and <laughs> it's going to hurt, but it's going to be very, very useful. Uh, culture tests, also something that you could obviously do here. Right. So, next one is uh, gaming for a non-gamer is, this is a, a little thing, um, this opened my eyes. Um, if you guys want, I really implore you to take a photo of this um, and look for it on YouTube. Uh, this is done by Rasputin and he basically took his wife, who is not a gamer, and told her to play games like Dark Souls and other hard things. Um, it's eye-opening um, for game designers and people who play a lot of games to see how a player that doesn't play games plays games. And it's an awesome uh, little video that you can uh, check out to pr present this exact bias that we all have as gamers. The game is too simple. We're gonna blast through this one a bit more. Um, so this basically starts happening when, we, like I explained before, the team already plays the game a lot and we just wanna up the ante on this one, right? We wanna, we wanna do more excitement, we wanna feel the adrenaline and whatever. Um, and it's actually the creator of um, Mario, so Miyamoto. Um, he actually says to his game designers usually, uh, take the game, take the controller and switch the hands and then play it like that. Uh, and I think the whole team that you are working with should also do that and try to play the game in that way because you're gonna see how new players are going to play this game, which is notably very badly probably at the beginning. Right, now the noticing of this part is again obviously user tests. They're your best friends. Use user tests and especially look for frustration or boredom maybe. So if the game is too simple, you're gonna see players just go, eventually, um, and just drop the game. If it's too hard, they're probably gonna do that as well, but they'll throw the phone at the wall as well. So that's gonna be a good indicator that the game might be too difficult. Okay, uh, data will also show a lot of stuff here because if, you can see a graph, usually if you're following your games, um, where like players die. And if you see a giant drop of players coming to level three, well, that's pretty obvious. Like, you need to fix your level two because people are dying there, right? Next, we are uh, we are at the stage where where this is probably a more of a game designer uh, sort of topic. So, roguelikes, when this happens, is but this one is very personal. I would say this you, oftentimes happens when new features come in. I had this experience actually at one of the games that I was working on because there was an already set game. It was there, it was working, it was great, it was awesome, right? And then I, as a really inexperienced game designer, came in and I was like, I need to put something new into the game. And I was like, I really like RPGs. And my first thought is always, I will put a talent tree into this game. And um, needless to say, a talent tree does not work for kids um, or anybody actually that isn't um, an RPG player and should not be in a game like that. However, my first instinct, whenever I try to design anything, is always, there could be a talent tree in there as well. 
So I always just usually, you know, when writing ideas on the on the on a, on a blackboard, I just go talent tree, and then I just do this because that always needs to happen, and then I continue with everything else essentially. And those are the good ideas usually. So you have to make sure that you don't stick things into the game that shouldn't be there. Um, and you do this, you notice this by exposing your ideas to others, people that don't know the game, people that maybe know you really well. Um, and that is the point where they can tell you, yeah, you know that roguelike mechanic in the football manager? No, 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 that is a no-no. All right, so we got the last one, and then we're gonna blast through the end because it is very late at this point. Okay, players are gullible. So when this happens, when are we trying to make more money? I think that it's um, not too much time needs to be spent here. Essentially, you need to make sure that your game is fair. And you can even notice this from your team when they're trying to play it. And if you already see your team's frustration when they get interrupted by, a, by an ad or something similar, or when players look at e-apps and nothing is selling, those, those, that data may also tell you that your um, in-app purchases might in fact be you know, a bit too greedy, but yes. So, those were all of these. Now, we're gonna look at a couple of things that, no, come on. It got stuck, there we go. So, we're gonna try to look at a couple of good practices that just help us avoid any of this happening. So, just a general overview, right? So, doing your market research. That is, I think, just a cleanliness thing, like making sure that a game that you're putting out is going to fit the market. If it doesn't, you might get lucky and you hit a target audience that you didn't expect, but you're probably just gonna hit nothing, right? The next one is set a strong product vision. When decisions are being made during a game, uh, during the game's production, if you don't have a strong vision, well, you might probably veer off course really badly. However, if you can describe your game in one sentence, and everybody that you tell it to knows exactly what that means, that can actually be a really strong thing to make sure that biases don't affect you. Because you might want to say, yeah, but we're, we should put a roguelike in it. And then you read the vision of the game and you're like, oh no, there shouldn't be any roguelikes in there. Enable good feedback. I think this is essential and crucial for any game designer. When asking for feedback, you will either usually get, it is good or this is shit. Both of those things are really bad as a game designer. You can't your, help yourself with any of that. So what I usually do is, oh, so it's, could, could you tell me more about why it's so shit? Um, is it too overwhelming? Is it too easy? Are you getting bored? Um, what, what would you do to the game to make it better? And then you're like, yes, this, there's too many things on the screen happening. I, don't even, I don't, can't even look at the screen. And you go back to the drawing board and you reduce the amount of stuff on the screen. You give the thing to the player and they're like, ah. Oh, Yes, this, this is what I wanted. Um, essentially, a game designer should be somebody who helps a person um, give good feedback, right? Effective user research. There's a very interesting learning that we've had at Outfit 7, um, and that's we assumed that players don't have fun if they play the game, and they don't show anything on their face. Now, of course, as user research is happening, you should leave the player be, right? They should figure stuff off on their own. That's the whole point of the user research. And if it's not, um, if they're not showing stuff on their face, you might think, oh no, we failed the game, it's horrible, they don't like it. But that's often not the case. Dig a bit deeper afterwards and ask them what they liked. And that's usually where you can find out if the, if the players actually like the game or not. Understanding your audience, of course, like Max said, like if you don't know who you're making the game for or you don't think about a target audience, then you're probably just gonna miss the mark. And the game is probably, you know, gonna flop. And the last one, because I needed something that's Instagrammable, understanding yourself. So this one is for biases, I think especially really, really important. Being mindful of the roguelikes that you like. Being mindful of the fact that you think that the game is too simple, but it might not be. If you're able to be mindful about all the decisions that you make, that'll make you a better game designer, that'll make you a better game developer, that'll make you a better game artist, and probably just a better human being as well, because <laughs> I could not resist, I'm sorry. Right, we've looked at all of the biases. We've looked at it worked before and it'll work again. We looked at how everybody knows what red hearts mean. We looked at the, how the game can be you know, too simple, because we know that, and because we all like roguelikes, and players are gullible. Now, these are some of the 
biases that we've noticed at Outfit 7. A uh, question, I guess, that I have for you guys is uh, which of your biases have you noticed while making games? And what are you going to do to find the rest of them? Thank you very much. Now, I, I went over time, I think, by five minutes, or is it seven? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> One? I mean, you're so charming. I, I do believe that someone wants to talk to you. Somebody wants to talk to me? Who wants to ask a question? <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, of Excellent. course. Yes, um, you can take mic there. You can, you can just come here, we can have two chairs, we can chat, sit, chat. All oh, right, I need to do this thing as well. Oh, you can't see anything. Oh, wow. Oh. Thank you. That was that was good. That was nice. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, my question, uh, quite regular for all game designers who is pitching something here. Yes. So, what what is your position for uh, game design Frankenstein's made with failing all that points you mentioned, all that biases, uh, and at the final you have like not elegant product not mm -hmm. elegant game design product. And after that, you understand that it contains a lot of influence of our biases. What is your take? To cancel or to tune? OK, so if I understand the question correctly, thank you very much for the question. But um, So you, you put a lot of features in. You basically Frankenstein the game. Um, and what your question is, what do I think about it in a sense that how would I fix it? Or would I decide to like just take a pillow and put it over the game's head and wait until it rests and sleeps and you kill it, essentially, right? Um, that is an extremely interesting question because uh, that happens a lot, I think, <laughs> um, in game design, right? So you've got the early stages of ideation where you basically Frankenstein the shit out of everything you're doing. You just take features and you cram them in and you just hope it'll work and you use your legs and everything. And sometimes it works, but that's really rare. Uh, it's really rare for that just to work. So I think this would be the, I think this would be the it, the game is too simple thing, because in theory you can have a really fun game with a stick that jumps up and down and there's stuff coming at it, right? That can be a really fun game already, but that's usually too simple. So we put more stuff into it, and a really important thing that I would do is I would strip away everything. I would have the product vision and only the product vision, and I would have that thing describe the game to me. For example, for stick, the first game we talked about, it's, it's a stick that goes to the right and you jump with it. That is it. And you would start from there. And then you start asking yourself, okay, so if the uh, stick is jumping, and we Frankensteined in hearts, so HP, and we Frankensteined in roguelike mechanics, right? Which one of these two feels better? And you can actually take the process, just make it a 50-50. You go to the baseline, which is stick going right, and then you 50-50 it for hearts and roguelikes. Does it feel more like a roguelike? Or does it feel more like it needs hearts, for example? And you can go into one direction if they're exclusive, of course. However, you need to do user tests. You need to do sanity checks. Because once you start doing this and going into like the mad scientist mode, right? Uh, you're going to think everything is a great idea. But that is where your team comes in. That is when you expose your work as a game designer and show it to other game designers. You show it to people. You play test the thing, the, the shit out of the game. And that's when you're going to find out if you've got a Frankenstein's monster on your table or if you're just cutting a diamond out of the rough, essentially. And hopefully it's the second right option. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. There you go. Question. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. I'm Liana and I'm a user researcher. so. Ooh, I'm nice. a big advocate for what you are saying. Um, uh, I wanted to ask if you had an example from your experience where you had some big bias and it was confronted by the data you received from players, by their feedback. Mm, yes. <laughs> I have one specifically, which is uh, the length of a tutorial. So I had the bias that the tutorial actually needed to be faster. Um, and it needs to happen, you know, a lot sooner and players need to not be bored and be like, yes, this is going to work, of course. And I was, uh, I was sure of myself. Um, but then we got data and there was a lot of people that like either jumped out or like the, the tutorial levels very quickly started dropping off. Um, and we had to fix that by making it a bit longer and a bit slower because people were saying there's too many things coming at us too quickly. And we slowed it down and it worked. Um, like players churned less. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
Um, yes, yes, and there was another one, but let's not waste all the time. Yes. Where's someone else? No? Last question. No? No one? Please. Um, I sure? have a question for you guys, actually. Um, uh, if somebody can answer it, we'll see. Um, I th firmly believe that there's stuff like this that happens to every game designer. So does anybody have a similar experience with either one of these or a completely different bias that has affected them when making games or their team, of course? And if you have had that experience, it would be very nice if you could share it with us so that we could all learn a thing. So does anybody have experience with this uh, sort of thing, essentially? I know, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Maybe no? they're not aware yet. Maybe that is uh, that is excellent. Yes. Um, well, in that case, thank you, everybody, um, and enjoy. I guess. Oh wait, that's yeah. your job. I'm so sorry. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Take my job. Yeah. So let's say thank you to this energy, like ending the day with so much chaos and charm. <laughs>